Hello, listeners. I'm Matthew Tong. In the news segment today, I'm joined with our beloved bassoonist Darius Farberman. How's it going, everybody? Good to be back. Before we begin our news segment today, I would like to first say thank you to our listeners for being patient and being supportive to our channel. We have had a very eventful month, from finals to graduations, so it was a very necessary break. I would also like to give a big round of applause to all the performers out there who have not only given such virtuosic recitals, displaying a repertoire of artistry and skills, but also being professional. Despite not being able to perform live for our audience, they still performed for us and showed the world their tremendous talent and passion. Darius, I know I watched your performance on YouTube, on the other side of the world in Taiwan. Could you tell us about your experience of the recital being in COVID? Yeah, Matt. I mean, it was definitely a very interesting project. Like I, before COVID, I really wasn't that tech savvy. I thought I was pretty good at stuff. Like I could, I could do YouTube and I could do like, like basic recording for auditions and whatnot. But to have to produce an entire concert on my own was really a foreign territory. It was something that just. Was was uh, like a beast of its own. The act of recording for performance, mixing and stitching audio from multiple takes to sound as clean and consistent as possible. Uh, I'm not saying I did it a lot. I tried to be as pure and natural as possible. Like I want to play on my own very well, so I don't have to do any editing. But the whole process of like creating a premiere or a broadcast or doing a live stream. You know, a lot of composers these days they're doing music on Twitch. They're premiering their new music on Twitch, the video game platform, which has become so huge, you know. So if anything, COVID actually, I, honestly, I'm not the only one to say this. I've talked to some of our friends at NYU. People, a lot of us performance majors think that if COVID didn't happen, we would not have learned to do all of this technology stuff in our degree during our curricula. It just would not have been there. So I have to thank COVID for that, for giving me an opportunity to explore some uh, new personal ways of uh, making projects and and thus making music. I mean, what do they say? It's called a blessing and the curse. It's a a blessing. It's called a blessing in disguise. Ah,、uh, blessing in disguise. There you go. That's that's the idiom. Yeah, I I would say like a lot of like different performers did, like performed it differently, performed their recitals differently. Obviously. Uh, for you, I don't know where you were exactly, but I could tell that you were at different stages, which was actually kind of interesting because you also had one with the piano, and then later you had one with the Iris Ensemble. Which shout out to Iris, that was that was amazing. And then you had, and、uh, yeah, and then you had a solo, which was a completely different place. Yeah, like these three different places. And I know, I know that you're not a tech savvy person because we've been friends for a while. Um, but but like this is such like a great experience for you. It kind of like makes you. To become tech savvy, because you're you're never gonna have this opportunity, probably ever again. Hopefully, not ever again. But it it forces you to do something different, to go out of your comfort zone, and、um, yeah, I think th- I think this entire thing was just great, and yeah, it was just professional, and you guys did such an amazing job. Thank you, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so we've got a lot of major news this week. I mean, this week has been—I mean, not just this week, like just the end of May and then the beginning of June. It's just been such a hectic couple of weeks, Darius. So, are you ready for these news that I'm going to bombard you with? You can go ahead and bombard me with it. I—I I can tell you right now, because of all the hecticness of finals, graduation, my recital, it's going to be as new to me as potentially our listeners. So, let's go ahead and jump right in. I love your puns. That's that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to start off with a banger for our listeners. According to CNBC, Amazon, the e-commerce giant, is spending eight point four five billion dollars to acquire MGM Studio. MGM, known as Metro Goldwyn Mayer, owns catalogs such as Die Another Day, Rocky, Rain Man, and many more. Darius, we know that Ma- An- we know that Amazon is not one of the major entertainment. Players that we talk about normally on this show, why do you think Amazon acquired MGM Studio, and do you think this is a good move for Amazon? I mean, they're a one point eight trillion dollar company. Why do they? Why do they bother? I think it's probably to compete with Disney. 
I think that Disney is another big force in the industry. With Disney Plus becoming a huge thing, Amazon wants to kind of amp up their inventory in terms of being able to produce movies, being able to produce films, music, uh, Amazon Video. I think Hulu is also, like, correct? I don't know. Is Hulu also owned by Amazon? Uh, it's owned by Disney. Oh, it's owned by Disney. Okay, so it goes the other way. But you know, the you know, like back in October, the movie Borat, the sequel to Borat, which was like a fifteen to twenty-five year old like original film. When that went on to Amazon, when that was a, released on Amazon as an Amazon Video film, it was huge. People were running to bo- to watch that movie, creating accounts on Amazon. People I knew that were like like totally against it wanted to see that movie and then got accounts and then just started exploring their catalog of other things so i think buying mgm is actually a good play because um it's definitely expanding their base of variety content for their consumers um so i mean i i don't really like to you know invest in amazon or anything i i've actually recently gotten into investing just a little bit which we could talk a little bit about later but uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, I think it's a good choice. Yeah, I mean, on on our Disney episode, I think it's just like real estates, right? What do they say about real estates? Location, location, location. What do they say about uh, streaming? Content, content, content. Content is key. Catalogs are key. They're, it just makes an extra barrier, despite them being expensive for the company. You know, uh, eight point five billion dollars is nothing to laugh at. You know, although it is Amazon. But, you know, content, content, content. That's what that's what matters, right? Yeah, of course. And I'm also glad you got into the investing game. Yeah, let me tell you. I'll tell you just a little bit about it for our, for our listeners. Um, I received a gift for graduation from my dad. And it was a cash gift. But he told me that, hey, I don't want you to use this on a nice steak dinner or on a party with your friends. I want you to put this into a new territory for our family. I want to see. I want you to leave it in there for 10 years and see if it works for you. Cryptocurrency. I've started investing just a little bit in cryptocurrency. I can hear you laughing. Uh, so and, not, and I can hear the listeners laughing too. Uh, I don't know anything about cryptocurrency. I didn't buy Bitcoin, but I can say that I bought um, a few shares of Stellar Lumens to see, and I'm just gonna leave the money in there. It's the third rising, uh, third highest rising currency next to Ethereum and Bitcoin. Um, aside from like Dogecoin, which is totally hot on the market right now, but they're starting from zero. Dogecoin is starting from zero, whereas these other three have been around the block for a little while longer. So I'm going to leave a little bit in there, see if I'd want to become an investor. But if not, you know, I go back to being myself, go back to being Darius. I don't like to play these games. You know, I prefer Mario and Luigi, but I mean, I'm totally fine with this. So giving it a shot, exploring new territory. That's what COVID has been all about. Exploring new territory in every sense of the word. Hey, I'm glad. I'm glad you, you. That was the first thing you hopped on. That's great, man. You, I mean, you, you always gotta start somewhere, right? You always gotta start somewhere. It's good to hear. All right, next we got Spotify. Spotify, the music streaming company, recently reported its uh recently reported its quarterly report. Twenty three million euro net income profit. Its second profitable quarter in a year. Obviously, the stock market was very very rational, so the stock fell by twelve percent at the end of April. Darius, was this a fluke or is there a reason for this huge sell-off? Um, I mean, I can't say for sure. What I'm curious about is, uh, the second, okay. So you said, you said that it rose in the second quarter of the year, right? The income profit in Europe, like for euros went up during that period. That's the spring. That's basically right around where we just came out of where, People are, let's say, you know, in Europe, I think, I think we can, if we're thinking about COVID here, this is 2021, we're still in COVID, the whole world is still in COVID. Europe in the spring has started to decline. COVID has started forcing people back home. They've started having to lock down in various countries, you know, a lot of orchestras and music industry has been kind of shutting down again for like, I believe the third wave they they were calling it. So that's increased listener bases from home. I think that Spotify, in a way, benefited from COVID because it got more people listening from Europe. Um, and as far as the stock falling by 12%, I would say that that's a direct result of uh, of the rise in interest and the rise in like user membership 
in Spotify and other like listening media and like Netflix, etc. Because really, Spotify is an Ameri- is like a North American. Uh, it's based in North America primarily. Europe doesn't really have as big of a uh, like a like a uh, connection to Spotify. But but I think this is not a fluke. I do believe that this is a direct result of COVID. COVID has seemed to be you know kind of running a lot of this news dis- news discussion. But yeah. I mean, yes, um, I've been trying for a long time trying to uh, prove Jerry wrong that Spotify is a good company. Uh, obviously, a profitable uh, quarter is what I expected. For, for, for those of us who aren't sure, he's referring to Jerry uh, Del Colliano, uh, professor at NYU, big business entrepreneur in the music industry. He was on episode three of season one. If you haven't checked that one out, go listen to it. Anyway, please continue. Yeah, please do. Um, Jerry's a great guy. He's 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 been in this business for quite a while. Um, I've 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 been trying my longest time trying to prove him that Spotify is is a great company. A lot of like the music insiders don't believe so. So one of my prediction for for the end of season one was that I believe Spotify is gonna have come up with two profitable quarters. This is one of them. So I'm just waiting for the other one. Let's see if my uh my 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 prediction comes true. However, the the I think. I think the real reason for sell-off was because, um, first of all, guidance. Um, second of all, it's just that their their growth their growth has been slowing down. Spotify, like I said, has been a growth company. Remember when we did like um, which stock you would buy with, between Spotify and Disney? And um, I think it was you that picked Spotify and um, Michelle that picked Disney because Disney is a value company, and whereas Spotify was uh, was a growth company. Yeah, the main word is growth, and if growth slows down, the hype slows down, um, and that's that's the main reason is that the growth really really slowed down during this quarter, and is obviously disappointing um, for a lot of investors. But the biggest thing that was uh, that was very disappointing is that the um, the revenue per customer that mark hit below five dollars. Spotify has really struggled to really struggled to amp up that number because they have the f- free subscriptions which, you know, allowed people to use Spotify for free. And because there's so many of those users, um, it start really decreasing because they're not producing revenue for the company, but they're adding more customers. So if you really do the division, more customer, more numbers in the denominator, while a few numbers in the numerator, obviously you're going to get a, a, get a lower ratio by then. So that was the real problem. And they, they seem to not be able to really monetize their consumers. And that's the really one of the biggest problems that a lot of investors are really raising their eyebrows. But I do think that for growth companies, they really need to get these customers in um, at the expense of profit- profitability, which they achieve, which is kind of curious. Yeah, no, totally. I can totally see your point of view from that. I guess we're not really we're not really in disagreement, I think. You're just looking at it from a more economical standpoint. Uh, so kudos to you. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, let's let's move on to, to now a really big one. Um, th- this has been a big news in the past few weeks. AT and T, obviously, um, AT and T, the cellular telecommunication giant and parent company of Warner Media, will unwind Warner Media business by receiving forty three billion dollars and combining Warner Media's content with Discovery. Obviously, AT and T seems very reasonable to talk in an entertainment show, but when we talk about Warner Media. Warner Media owns many media platforms such as HBO, which produces shows such as Game of Thrones and Westworld. Darius, why is AT&T doing this? And what does this say about their uh, Warner, Me- Warner Media acquisition in 2016? Well, I think that in this particular situation with Warner Media having been a lot larger before, it had a much larger fan base and and like consumer it, it, it was a, it was it had a lot more attention per se in the past before COVID in the 2010s and or in the uh, in the early 2000s too with all of their like early like contributions to uh, uh, the entertainment industry I would say that this particular move of AT&T partnering up with or I I rather actually Warner Media's acquisition of AT&T it's just like really it's it's just like the Amazon and MGM situation it's just a matter of coming it, it feels just to me like they're coming together to kind of increase their user base, create offers, deals, packages for consumers that would economically benefit both consumers and uh, and their business. So as far as and as far as 2016 goes, uh, when they did acquiesce uh, AT&T, I think that's exactly why. 
So, uh, HBO is also owned by Warner. HBO Max, too, I believe. So, you know, with HBO under their belt, Warner is just going to continue growing and, and like, not... They, it's added security. Buying out other companies, as we've seen with Disney. Disney was the first one to do it. They bought out Lucasfilms, who made Star Wars. They bought out, I think, like, a few other big names. Uh, Pixar originally wasn't a part of Disney either, you know? So, it's just another, like... Another chip falls onto their side of the table, if you will. True. Um, yeah, I mean, in, the, in a lot of media companies, you really see a lot of acquisition. I mean, that's sort of like the gist of how media companies work. Um, the real problem here is that AT&T has, like, like you said, you know, the whole point of acquisition is not only to, you know, expand business, but also acquire customers. That's the whole point that you would spend that money. Um, the problem was that they couldn't really expand Warner Media's business. Um, the value that they sold it at is is not a great price, especially when you differ the fact that um, the selling price and also the buy price is about the same after five years. It's just not a great investment on AT&T's side. Um, so this was a very incredibly bad look on AT&T. And also, you know, you just kind of have to look at it from also another perspective, just like, just like you said about Amazon, you know, Amazon acquiring MGM and the whole point is to expand its catalog. Um, uh, this, I mean, you could say that for also Warner Media and Discovery combining, and also AT and T spinning this off. The the real problem is that how are you going to compete in this very incredibly competitive environment of the streaming wars? I mean, we've talked about it in Disney. The whole point, the reason why Disney is surviving is not also because of a low price point, but also because Disney has got so much content going from its side. Um, I just wonder if uh, Discovery, I mean, they call it Discovery Plus. How many pluses are we going to have? Um, you know, I just wonder if Discovery and Warner Media is really going to stand out amongst the big giants such as Netflix, such as, um, you know, such as Hulu, which is owned by Disney, Disney Plus. And then now we have so many much more other companies that's just trying to take a piece of the pie. It seems like everything is really just going into, like, three branches of entertainment. A Disney branch, a Warner branch, and a, a Amazon branch. I feel like it's just, everything is sort of coming together. And Netflix, okay, four. Four big, big powers and everything around them, you know? Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. And, um, I mean, I mean, it's, we're just gonna have to see. And also, we've also got the COVID factor. We'll see how that plays into, because COVID, I mean, slowly the country is opening up. I know you guys are seeing uh, are seeing sunshines and all that while we're, we're, we're seeing rains all the time in Taiwan here. But um, the thing is that when people start going out, are there going to be more subscribers? Are there going to be more users watching contents? Are there going to be more streaming consumers? I mean, that's also another big question. You've, it's already a competitive environment. And now there's no um, there's no there's no tailwind trying to push this even more forward. Yeah, absolutely. If anything, I'd say that. Um that COVID, when COVID goes away, I'd say, you know, we're looking, the world, like, US, like you said, is doing really well right now, and is going to be out of it, possibly by the fall. Uh, but as far as the rest of the world, it's going to take probably a full another year. So if we're looking at it now until like June 2022, you know, it might be that all the big entertainment industries might expect a drop. You know, when people stop, like, going out and stop doing stuff. Or stop, start going out and stop staying in, stop consuming. Exactly my point. I mean, in the near future, you can still see the tailwind still blowing in their way. But until when it really starts, um, when COVID really starts going away, which is sooner than later, um, you know, where, where where's the momentum going to go? If anything, yeah, if anything, right now, they're at a plateau. They're nearing a plateau before going down. So anyway... Okay. Okay. Lastly, recently BTS's new song called uh, Butter has racked up around 21 million streams in the first day. However, according to Music Business Worldwide, around 10 million streams are being discounted. This is because according to Spotify's chart rule, it is, quote, only the first 10 plays of a track by each user on the platform are chart eligible within each 24 hour period. What is going on here, Darius? And do you think this is a big issue in terms of uh, algorithm and all that going on? Okay, first off, I have not listened to this new track yet. But what I know is that 
BTS is really on fire. They've been on fire for the past, like, five years. Just really on the rise culturally, uh, you know, which, which, which might even be in comparison to what we're going to talk about in our upcoming episode. Uh, but, like, it's, it's a really big, it's, BTS is big. BTS has become a really big thing. And to see 21 million streams in one day after the release of an EP, or, it, it, it's just huge. So, as far as Spotify and the chart algorithms, I actually see it kind of like YouTube. When YouTube, for example, when YouTube sees someone, like a YouTuber, getting really big, they try to limit the amount of money they make by, by monetizing and putting in more ads, or doing things like putting in less ads, which give re less revenue to views and subscribes and comments. Uh, so, I think that in Spotify's case, if anything, this would just be a way to kind of like help market themselves and help like, and try to like, kind of, I don't know, I don't want to use this word, but blood suck, if you will, the, the, the fruit from which BTS is growing. So, uh, that's my personal opinion. I don't think it's really, it's, it's, it's like, it's like the Taylor Swift thing. When we talked about this last fall, when Taylor Swift lost the rights to her songs, you know, it, it's, it's something like that. They just want, they just want to reap off some of the benefits, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I definitely do agree with that aspect, you know, um, Spotify kind of just don't want to pay that extra, um, pay a lot of the money so they kind of put a cap on. I mean, that's one side of your the four artist side. But on the other hand, you can also look at it from the other perspective is that um, fans often like to boost numbers and a lot of actually a lot of entertainment companies do this. They tell the fans or they tell whoever who works in the company, say, oh, we're going to release, let's just say Darius releases absolutely beautiful song or whatever wonderful song and what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask the entire um 1000 employees to play play the song for the entire t for the first 24 hours just keep playing it keep playing it pl keep playing it. and i think spotify looked at this and say hey you can't cheat the algorithm like this so you can also look at it look at it from the other perspective um i definitely think that this is not really a big issue um i don't i don't think this is gonna go anywhere but i do think that um when, when it comes to like the metadata aspect of it, we're gonna have to really look into this and say like, what is really pure data and what is like cheating the algorithm? Um, I mean, this, it's hard to say because we don't have anything anything more to go off of. Um, so thank you, Darius. Thank you, thank you for coming to the show. Yeah, of course. And uh, thank you to everybody for tuning in for this little news segment here on Surround Sound. Yeah, bye-bye. We also want to thank Matt Klein for writing our awesome jingle for Surround Sound. Thanks, Matt.